I know, last before lunch. But um, so I assume all of you are here because this is a conference on innovation and entrepreneurship, and there's some interest in that area. How many of you have had an idea that you think would solve a problem in your life? Come on, come on, come on. And keep your hands up. And if you've had that idea, how many of you have filed an invention disclosure with Ohio State? See, there's good for those of you who have, but it's much less than the number who've had the idea. So one of the things we really want to make sure that if you have this fabulous idea, one of the first ways that we get you to, on the commercialization pathway is that you file an invention disclosure with our office. It's a really simple way to go about doing things. There's a little system called Innovate. It takes about um, 10 or 15 minutes to, uh, to input your idea, and that's the way that we get to see your ideas um, and begin the process that DJ just described of triaging all of those. Um, because this is our mission, to get those ideas out there where they can have an impact on the world. So we have a whole team that's there to assist you. We have um, 10 licensing managers and uh, two licensing analysts, and we have a new ventures team, which is which now numbers three, to help you on the startup side of the equation. So a startup, how we define startup companies. Uh, startup companies are companies that were formed specifically to bring a technology that was developed at the Ohio State University to market. We are seeing a, um, a much larger number of our license agreements are in the form of a startup company because we have a big change in the marketplace. When you talk about what corporate customers are willing to do, back before kind of 08, 09, you saw a lot of companies who were willing to invest in the research side of the equation. And they were willing to take that risk because that's what they were rewarded for. What we're seeing now is that companies are much more risk averse and they are willing to invest, whereas before they might have been willing to invest a million dollars in 300 different enterprises and get three hits, today they're willing to invest in one $300 million enterprise because they are able to justify that risk equation much better to their shareholder base. On an NPV basis, may not have been the best decision, but that's what we're seeing happen in the corporate marketplace from a licensing perspective. So what we've gone to and what you see happening is there's been much more of a shift to the startup side of the equation. And what the purpose of the startup really is to do, it's not to, it's not to become the next Facebook, it's not this viral marketing. We're talking about real, about technologies that have had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of research already put behind them. But they're not yet at a place where you can call them a finished product. They're a finished product, you see corporations who are willing to license them. But what we're looking at is we're at, at kind of that product in development. It's still a technology. You still need to go through a lot of the exercises that our first speakers spoke about, such as what problem is this, is this technology solving? Who will pay for it? What's the value proposition? And that takes time and that takes effort and that takes capital. And that's really what the role of the startup company is. So if you look and you see what are some of the benefits and the challenges, if we have a uh, technology that's already to the point where it's almost a product, and we can license that to an existing company, it's, we can license that to Medtronic or Thermo Fisher, um, that's a much faster path to market. It's not very much effort on our part. We simply license the technology, they use their distribution system, and off it goes. But if it's to the point where they'd have to spend a lot of time doing research and development, they have to do clinical trials, they have to go through all of that, they'd much rather that the startup company take on those risks and challenges. And then the founders of that, if it's successful, get to reap the benefits. And we have found that if you look at startup companies, if you look at all of the companies that venture capital invest in, and you look at those that came out of research institutions like Ohio State, they tend to be much more successful than those that did not, simply because you have a lot of, it's not just an idea on the back of a napkin, it's something that has a lot of clinical validation that's already behind it. So if you have an idea, 
how do you know if it's going to become a startup or if it's going to become a license? We sit down with you, all of our licensing managers, our startup managers, we meet with you to decide what is the best pathway to commercialization. We're not looking at where we can make the most money. We're looking at what is the best way to get your product to the market where it can have impact. Because that's our biggest hurdle. How do we get it out there? So we sit down together and decide what's the fastest, best approach to get this out to the marketplace. So you've gone through a little bit in, uh, with DJ as far as what the steps are to begin to engage with us. So our first, uh, first step is file those invention disclosure forms. It's really important. Uh, we meet, then we'll meet with you um, and we'll figure out the pathway. And then once we have the pathway, there's basically three components if you figure, if, if you, the pathway is a startup company. There's three components, tech, the technology, a business leader, and capital. And that's really where we're going to be talking about the, where I'm going to be talking about the rest of this for the most part are those three pieces of the equation. Now, the technology piece of the equation clearly lies with you. You are the one coming up with the solution to the problem. But we don't expect you to leave your day job. I mean, you can if you want. But maybe you want to mitigate the risk of that for a while. See if it takes off before you actually decide to leave your day job and join the startup company. So what we look to do is, first of all, we put a team behind you. You're not expected to know how to negotiate the agreement or how to incorporate the company. You're not expected to know what the pathway to market is. So we'll put a team around you that will help you do that. Um, one of the, some of the resources that we provide, first we can provide, um, if you look at, I guess, um, DJ's introduced Carolyn and spoke about the executive in residence program. That's a team of advisors who can really help you decide, is there a business pathway to this technology? Um, then if it turns out that we do decide that that's the way to go, we then we're a little bit like eHarmony, where we match up business leaders who have that, ex that specific area of expertise with your technology and the type of expertise that it needs. So we match up folks in, for example, the med device industry who understand that channel with med devices, and we don't match them up with the gear that engineering's producing. So we have a fairly uh, strong talent pool that we uh, draw from. Sometimes we have really experienced entrepreneurs that are just sitting around waiting for the right technologies. Sometimes we have technologies that wait for the right entrepreneurs. But for the most part, we are matching up some of the, a large number of those technologies with very qualified entrepreneurs. Um, when I first got here, which is almost five years ago now, we had 12 startup companies. Today we have 69. So clearly that's been one part of the equation is we've really had that talent pool come together to help get your technologies to the market. Um, funding, validation, the ecosystem that DJ was talking about, our Rev1 partners, our partnership with CDME, uh, all of those are resources that have been brought to bear on your technology. So um, Apple clearly was uh, the, 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 having two co-founders rather than just one. Building a team is a really important part of the equation. But, um, and we've talked a little bit about the business leader and the fact that they have experience, but I really want to talk about the difference between the business leader and the inventor, because the inventor gets to stay part of the equation if the inventor chooses. So here's a couple of different scenarios. One may be that the inventor is incredibly passionate about this, wants to be very, very committed, they can take their faculty, they can take 20% of their time, and they can devote that to the startup company. So they could join the startup company, and the startup company can compensate the inventor with cash, but not usually, because most of the time startup companies don't have a lot of cash ready to spend on personnel. Instead, they'll compensate the inventor with equity. And that's in addition to the equity that the university gets and sends back to the inventor. So there's kind of two ways the inventor can participate from a financial perspective. On the other hand, the inventor might say, you know what, this is just one of a portfolio of ideas that I have. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this idea, but I have this great postdoc 
who is very well, or grad student, who is super excited about this, and I'm going to send that person over and be the technical advisor for the startup company. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes there's um, three founders who, three inventors, and they're all involved. So it goes back to you as an inventor, what do you want to do, and what are your goals? How involved do you want to be, and how much do you want to participate in this? So that is, um, th that, that's your choice. On the other hand, the CEO that we're dealing with, that's the person who's being full-time on the business side of the equation. They may start off having to keep, they don't get paid except in equity, at least at the beginning. So we have to find just the right person, the person who's able to maybe has a consulting business who can, or who has been a serial entrepreneur and already has a sufficient income to live for a while without a, uh, with, without a steady paycheck. So those are the challenges of finding the business leaders. So obviously they've been folks who have been successful in the past because they're able to work um, with, the, with the startup company on a uh, for equity only basis. Any questions so far? Yeah. So it, it takes time for the startup to start working. Um, so in fact, you will need to take time off from their day job at the university to, to at least get it off the ground. Um, does, is your office responsible for getting that actually that time off, I said 20% of the time, to start working on a startup? Um, if the success rate is 0.01%. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm, great. I'm, I'm kind of piggybacking on the other question that as faculty, our, our time is like fully booked by somebody else. I mean, when will this become, okay, this is a waste of time. I'm not allowing you to spend 20% of your time to pursue this versus um, we have an idea and we think it might work, and this 20% of the time is something that the university will like sanction in return for a chance for this work. Well, that 20% of your time is your choice because that's 20% of your time currently under policy where you can do consulting, where you can do speaking engagements. Okay, all right. So the portion of your time that's free from university requirements, you can spend on the startup company and uh, that is your choice. You do have to go through a process where you clear with your department, share, et cetera. Um, but that also doesn't prohibit you working on non-university time, such as evenings and weekends on the startup company. But it's not something that's prescribed by the university. It's something that really is um, up to your preference and based upon the needs of your department. Yes? Did that answer it? Yeah. Now, that's one of the reasons why we say fast fail is really good. Because even if you do have 20% of your time, you, that's time that's a, there's an opportunity cost to that time. So we make sure that we're vetting these technologies that we're moving into the startup company. And we are looking to see, do they have traction in the market? And we take sort of baby steps in that regard so that when we actually launch, there's a CEO who has validated this by saying, yes, they're willing to spend a great deal of their time for an equity only compensation. And then there's also capital that said, we're willing to invest capital in this business and risk actual money on it to make to see it go forward. So you're not in it alone. There's other people there who are helping you assess the risk of this venture and the probability of success. Now, the probability of success, as, as um, was described before, of kind of earning over the million dollars. Um, I would say that the startup side tends to, um, you can be successful without producing a million dollars a year. Uh, it can, many of the startups are acquired before they get to a certain point in time. Uh, so they have proceeds of greater than a million, but they may not have sales of greater than a million. So it kind of depends too on when you want to exit. Um, so the role that the inventor plays in the business is, tends to be not as CEO, but tends to be as the chief technology officer, the chief medical officer. Uh, and there's some different arrangements, as you were discussing, on how you can um, work with the startup company. 
So um, there's two basic ways uh, beyond the uh, working actively in the business as an employee that you can engage. One is from a consulting arrangement and one is from a sponsored research arrangement. In a sponsored research agreement, the dollars flow to the university. In a consulting agreement, the dollars flow to you as an individual, as the inventor. In a sponsored research agreement, there is the expectation that intellectual property will be created. And in a consulting arrangement, there's the idea that intellectual property is not expected. In a sponsored research agreement, we're using uh, facilities at Ohio State. You can work in your lab. If it's a consulting agreement, you're not expected to use university resources, but you could use the resources that are available at the company. So these are the kinds of arrangements. Um, you can get, if you're doing a consulting agreement, you can choose to get paid in cash or you can choose to get paid in equity. But you can also choose to become an employee of the company. So those are some different ways that you can interact. Um, when you do this, you do have to manage your conflict, potential conflicts of interest. So as I, I said, you need to clear a lot of this with your department chair. If you're using university resources, you have to go through and you have to create a um, conflict of interest management plan. Sometimes you may not have the conflict, but the institution has the conflict. So for example, if you created some wonderful product that can save patients' lives and we want to do a clinical trial at the university, sometimes we're not allowed to do that beyond a certain stage because the university has a vested interest in seeing the product be successful. So there's an innate, an innate bias at the institutional level to see the product succeed or the technology be successful. So when we get past a certain point, uh, we have to clear not only individual conflicts of interest, but institutional conflicts of interest. So those are some of the things that you have to think about as you engage with the technology. So before we um, move on to the, the sort of the technology piece of the equation and the licensing process itself, are there any more questions you have on, on sort of the inventor role? Yes. Let's see. Um, I would say that currently we have a pipeline of, say, 100 potential startup companies. I expect that over the next year, 20% will head out into a startup company. But that also may mean that maybe another 20% will go out the following year. Uh, and probably there's another 20% that don't go out in a startup company but go out in a license agreement to an existing company. So that would be my rough kind of, I, I don't really have any sort of uh, actual stats at my fingertips, but that's kind of my feel of how things tend to shake out. And there's some that um, don't get licensed through a traditional uh, method but might go on the uh, the Buckeye Tech Smart. So we decide that that's it, maybe they don't have a large enough market to attract an entrepreneur, <coughs> excuse me, or to attract capital, but are ways that we can still make an impact by putting them out through an online marketplace. So we take, we go a different, couple of different ways. We need to, since we have the technology, we need to get it into a company. We've identified the CEO. The CEO is actually the one who forms the company. And then we license or option the technology to the company itself. So there's a couple different ways that we do this. The option is a short term, generally very low cost way for the CEO to run some um, pre-vetting of the commercial viability of the technology in the market. Uh, sometimes companies skip that option process altogether. Sometimes it's required in order to, um, that we have some grant funding that's available that is, the state offers and there it's available only if there's not a license agreement in place yet. So in order to make that hold the company options, the technology. But the options expected to expire fairly quickly and it's supposed to move into a licensing process. Licensing has um, these different components of commercialness associated with them. This is where the proceeds come back from the company to the university if the company is successful. So 
one of the traditional uh, fees that you see in a license agreement is an upfront fee. This is what used to happen when, com when companies licensed technology from the university established companies. Today, when we look at startup companies, they're really focused on developing the technology into a product. And we want the money that's coming in to go toward that purpose of developing the technology. So we're generally not taking an upfront fee in cash. What instead we're doing is we're taking that upfront fee in the form of equity. And what we're saying is we'll share, we, the university, will share the risk of this technology with you. So rather than taking cash up front, we're going to take a percentage of the equity. And if the company's successful, then we all benefit. And if the company's not successful, then it didn't cost anything out of pocket. Now, we have an anti-dilution threshold in there with equity because what makes the university go from owning 100% of a technology to licensing it to a startup company and, say, going down to 15%? What do we give up for that 85%? And what we we're giving up are two things. One, we're giving up 85% in order to attract an entrepreneur, a really good startup leader who has great experience who can bring this to market. But one of the principal activities of a startup leader is to raise capital. And the capital providers are going to need equity, too. So we say, can you bring, we want you to bring so many dollars to the table. And generally, we define that dollar threshold as a point just before you head out for a real venture capital Series A round. So say it's a million dollars. So we say that um, you're going to come to the table with a million dollars in your expertise, and in exchange for that, you get 85% of the company, and we'll keep 15. Another way that we, the university, can profit and from the success of a company is when it actually hits sales. And we do this because oftentimes startup companies are sold before they ever hit sales. So how do you continue to participate in the benefits of that? If you look at those big drugs, how are those making all that money for the university? It's off of that royalty. So there's a royalty rate associated with the product as well. Um, we set milestones, and these milestones are generally commercial-based milestones so that we make sure that the company, whether it's a startup or an existing company, doesn't park that technology. We want to make sure that they're continuing to develop that technology and get it to market. So we have commercialization milestones in place that make sure that the company is proceeding on track to develop the technology to its appropriate endpoint. And then if there are patent expenses associated with that technology, we do look for the startup company to um, pay the ongoing patent expenses, but to also, once they become cash flow positive, to start reimbursing the university for its past patent expenses as well. Our goal is really to keep the startup company with as many dollars as possible to develop that product. And um, through the license agreement, uh, you see the uh, negotiations happen. If we look at the business leader, the entrepreneur negotiates with the university for, with regard to those equity stakes and milestones and such that we just discussed. And then separately, the entrepreneur, the CEO, will negotiate with the inventor. So there are two separate negotiations going on. Ohio State and the TCO represent just this university portion of that e negotiation equation with the company. The negotiation between the inventor and the company is done separately. The TCO does not represent you as an individual inventor in terms of what you're trying to get accomplished. So we recommend that we can help you say what's customary, what we've seen in the past, some guidelines. But we recommend that you get independent counsel to rec represent your individual interest as the inventor when you're going through that negotiation process. So you can get equity both through the university portion and through your stake, an independently negotiated stake as well, that is dependent on your participation, how much time you're spending in it. And there will probably be vesting and uh, various hurdles that you have to get in order to qualify for that equity on a going forward basis. So um, 
we talked a little bit about taking uh, why the university takes equity in that equation to reduce the cash flow, cash outflow from the startup company, and we share the risk. It makes us a real partner in the equation. As those proceeds come in, we there's the current distribution policy uh, according to the policy on patents and copyrights. The first seventy-five thousand dollars of any proceeds that come in from a license agreement a startup or a, or a license to an existing company is split 50-50 between the university and the inventor. And the university takes its 50% portion and applies it to all those patent expenses that no one's um, reimbursing us for. For amounts above 75, the split is 25% goes to the university, 33% uh, goes to the inventor, 21% goes to the college and 21% to the department. So that 42% is basically, it could be a college, it could be a center, it could be the department. It's where you receive, the you or the inventor group has received funding from. Now we're in the process of going through a new policy on patents and copyrights, which is out there um, at the university for comment right now. But it only improves the, uh, the economics to the inventors. So um, getting ready to turn to the capital side of the equation, this is, you know, th this is where a lot of universities have, have significant amount of difficulty. They have technology, they're, they're able to find the business leaders, or they could if there was capital available, but it's really difficult at this early, early stage. If you have large corporate partners who aren't willing to take the risk and put capital into this business, it's even harder to get venture capitalists to do this. And we rely upon a lot of subsidized funding within the state of Ohio to get us to the point where we can grow these companies up to a place where they're viable. It's one of the reasons why you see, if you looked at the number of startup companies formed in the past five years and the number of them that are still alive today, that proportion is huge. I think out of the, I think we have 69 active today. I think we might have, ugh, four on top of that that were formed within that time period that haven't made it. And they haven't made it truly not, it's usually not because of a lack of funding and it's usually not at least that early in the game because the technology failed. But it's usually because as the CEO went out and looked at the market there and did that market validation process, they found that there was not a true market need for that solution. So the capital is really, really allowing the technology to get traction in the marketplace. So one of the things we, that we look at, and we'll look at in conjunction with you, like I said, there's a team behind you. So there's, this, there's the business leader. There's the startup team. There's the inventor. We all gather together to figure out and, uh, how much capital that startup company is going to need. Where do we think we can get that from? What should the equity structure look like? How much should the inventor get? How much should the founders get? How much do we think the capital is going to require in that? And we work a lot with, um, with our partners at Rev1 because oftentimes they're the ones who are managing that, uh, those early stage funding vehicles. So when we look at the different sources of capital, um, one of the things that we say, if you are still able to get research funding, do not form a startup company. If you are still able to get millions of dollars out of NIH, please keep doing that. Because it's much harder to get commercialization money, to get the VC money, money because they are, there's very different expectations. They're, the VC capital is expecting to make a return on their investment. So it's harder to get, there's more due diligence that they go through, and, they're, um, and they actually end up forming a strong partnership with the inventor. You guys are a team. If you guys don't get along, this isn't gonna work. So that's one of the things that we continually talk about. We have meetings ahead of time to make sure that all of the sources are on the same page, have the same objectives. So we look at, um, when we look at commercialization funding, there are some sources that we have that are called dilutive sources and some that are called non-dilutive sources. So dilutive sources will require equity in the company and therefore dilute or lessen your ownership stake or the existing shareholder's ownership stake. The non-dilutive sources are grants. 
The money's free, you don't have to pay them back, it, they don't take additional equity in the company, but they might have some strings attached to them on how they're spent. So for example, if you look at the non-dilutive sources of funding, one of the things that we have in Ohio, which lots of states don't have, is something called the, uh, the Technology Validation and Startup Funding Grants, or TVSF. These are grants that are up to $150,000 if you're a life sciences startup, $100,000 otherwise. And you go through an application process. It's a six-page application process. The TCO will help you write this. We've done this a lot of times, with, and we have a very good success rate. The state has an re external review committee that they use to review these applications. They'll go through and they'll figure out which ones they like. And if they think that um, there's promise from a commercial perspective for these applications, then they'll invite the team in for an interview. And then if the team successfully gets through the interview process, they are awarded these funds. It takes about three months altogether. And the, so it's a relatively short time frame relative to other capital raises, but the, the uh, string associated with the TBSF money is that you can't spend it on um, any employees or personnel of the company. Anybody who has equity in the company, the money can't go to them, and it can't go to travel. State just doesn't want to deal with like the person who decided to form a company and go to Hawaii on a business trip, so they just said forget it. But um, other than that, when it's used for technology development, it's exactly what the grants are for. We've talked a little bit about SVIRs and STTRs, so those are other good sources of non-dilutive funding for startup companies. And then there's other odd grants that are available that it's possible that we can help you with. On the dilutive side of the equation, generally you'll, you're seeing from the least mature portfolio companies down to the most mature. So we really start off a lot with angels and other investors, the friends and family and founders and fools. Um, and then the accelerators. And we can, uh, we'll talk a little bit about specifically about that accelerator stage funding because that's the funding that has been subsidized both by the state of Ohio and by Ohio State University to help the startup companies. So what that might look like. So at the beginning we talked a little bit about like maybe there would be, we'd have something say maybe the OSIF, the, which is the Ohio State Innovation Foundation, that is a not-for-profit entity. It's 100% owned by Ohio State, and it's the vehicle through which we do our licensing because it owns all of the intellectual property of the university. So say we start a company, and um, OSIF gets 15%, say the inventor gets 5 and the founder has 80% of the company. Right now, the company doesn't have anything more than people willing to work really hard and a technology. So what we need to do is bring some capital into the equation. So we bring in what's a, called a pre-seed investor. It's not even seed. We're getting the ground ready for the startup. So the pre-seed investor comes in. We have a vehicle called the concept fund that helps proof of concept activities for the startup company. And that's uh, a fund that's managed by Rep. One, and the state and the university both put in the capital beyond that. So we want to get diluted by our own capital. So you see, like the OSIF portion of the a piece of the pie didn't change from a percentage perspective, but the pie just got bigger. Once you pass that threshold, and you start bringing in some some more manage some more capital to the equation, you start to see the university portion will get smaller and smaller. The pie's getting bigger, but now the university's portion is less. And you'll also see that the, um, the inventor's getting diluted, but now the inventor might be in that founder and other management part of the equation. And the founder and the management team, we always, the capital providers, everybody who are shareholders in the company, want to make sure that those folks stay very incentivized. So generally that's done in the form of options, and that option pool tends to be replenished with each capital raise that occurs. So you'll see that the founders and the management team tend to 
get more from both a percentage basis and a value of the company basis because we want to make sure that the folks responsible for the success continue to be rewarded for their efforts. So the pie gets bigger as more and more people come in. So hopefully, even if your percentage is less, your dollar value is more. So the way that we have to, the way we do this is by bringing in all these sources of capital. So we grow your business up from the point of small, where it's just these, this accelerator award, for example, only funds technologies. And then we go through all of these other, uh, think of them as steps as you go through the various capital raises, and those form companies. So I want to talk a bit about the accelerator awards. So have any of you, raise your hand if you've heard of the Accelerator Awards. Oh, good. OK, because that's an important part of our process. Uh, we are running those currently four times a year. The process opened um, on Monday for the current round of awards. And I believe they're due, the, these applications are due December 14th. And these are technologies that are need a little bit more development, a little bit more maturation before it's ready to be licensed to a startup. There's two requirements currently to file an accelerator award. One is that you have an invention disclosure on file with the TCO. So that's the way you select. And if you have lots of them, when you go in to apply for an accelerator, it'll give you a drop-down menu of all your invention disclosures, and you choose which one you're applying for. If you've never done an invention disclosure before, when you go to apply for the award, there won't be anything that shows up, so you won't be able to do an, an application. The other thing is this is half funded by the state, half funded by the university. The goal of the state in these accelerator awards, as well as with the TVSF program, is to create jobs and startup companies in central Ohio. So there at least has to be, with your, um, if to apply for an accelerator award, there has to be some basis upon which to potentially form a startup. So like I said, they're um, four times a year up to $100,000, and they are to be used in things tangible. How do you get this to market? How do you show a proof of concept? Can you, do we have to create a prototype? Do we have to do a market analysis to figure out where the best market point of entry is? Do we have to employ some regulatory consultation to figure out what the FDA pathway on this? Can this be a 505B2? Can this be a 510K? What's the fastest path to market? And what are the hurdles we're going to have to jump through? So we can better define the rest of the equation, which is how much capital do you need to raise? How long is the time to market? What should the plan be? So that has been a, um, a program that we started in 2015. Uh, we started running it twice a year. And this year, 2017, is the first that we've been able to run it four times a year. So it's definitely getting traction. And it's definitely uh, feeding the development of lots of these technologies. And would love to have all of you get to the point where you're submitting for accelerator awards. If you've had a successful accelerator award, it's proven that, yes, there's a need for this technology. The next thing we have you do is apply for this technology validation and startup fund grant, which, like I said, is up to 150 for a life sciences company or 100,000 otherwise. The state is the one who supplies these funds, and the state is the one who makes the decisions on these. But it's a grant, and it's a great way to start a company. That's one of the big things we do when we recruit CEOs, is we say, look, you can get a technology and you, that has um, maybe 100,000 of funding behind it, and you can get another 100,000 from the state. And the cost of doing that is really your $100 Secretary of State filing fee. So we can get a company up and running. We can have a te technology that's licensed to the startup company that has seed capital to begin to develop that company, all for a very nominal amount. And that has been very successful, has proven to be very successful in recruiting CEOs. So if you have friends out there who you think would be good CEOs, please also you can send them to our office. It's a good value equation for them. Um, and again, this money is to be spent on development of the technology. Then, going on the next step of the continuum, is there's two funds that are managed by Rev1. One. one is called the Concept Fund. That fund is 100% devoted to startups that come out of Ohio State. It's developed specifically for your startup companies. 
And that money is often comes in alongside that TVSF grant money. Primarily because the TVSF grant money is a, is a reimbursement model. So you basically, you spend your dollar, you submit the invoice to the state, and they pay you back your dollar. That's fine if it's a dollar, but when you're talking about $100,000, maybe you don't want to come out of pocket $100,000, or it would, it would take a long time to piece that out. And so oftentimes we marry a TVSF grant with concept fund money of another 100000 so it helps the cash flow of the startup company. This is funding that is, the concept fund money is dilutive. It's generally in the form of a note with a warrant. Assuming that you've gone through all that money and you have some, a market and you're beginning to get some customer traction with your product, you then can move on to the next step in the funding continuum, which is the Rev1 fund. The Rev1 fund invests in Ohio State startup companies, but it also invests in startup companies throughout the rest of the ecosystem too. Ohio State is one of the largest limited partners in this fund, and we do serve on the advisory council for the fund. It, we are incredibly supportive of having this stage capital in central Ohio. There's not lots of areas that have this pre-seed, seed, and seed plus stage capital that's really here to support our ecosystem. So it's a real benefit in terms of getting all of your technologies to market. So just a, a couple things I wanted to say about funding, and before we open it up for some more questions, is it's, it's much more than transactional. This is very strategic when you go to choose a capital partner. Um, this isn't a decision that you want to make lightly. We have lots of meetings set up between the CEO, the inventor, the capital provider to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So that, I guess, is one of the most important considerations as you go forward. The other thing is, is when you go to compare your startup company with somebody, another faculty member's startup company, and you're talking about how much equity you got in the company and then how much equity they got in the company. Remember that pie. Where you start to, where you're comparing your percentage equity sort of depends on what part of the pie you're in. So did you get 15% of the company, but it hasn't raised any capital yet? Uh, so maybe that's not worth as much as someone who has 2% of a company that's raised a billion dollars of capital. So you really want to make sure you're comparing sort of apples and apples as you're talking comparisons with other folks and what their startup companies look like. There's a big difference between what we call pre-money and post-money valuations. So those are important things to know. Um, before we move on to some of the resources, does anybody have questions on the capital side of the equation? Okay, I know we're getting really close to lunch and there's only like two more slides, so. Um, do we provide space? Uh, we don't, but our partners at Rev1 have space for startup companies. Uh, we use them as an incubator accelerator, so they have space that's available. And we do have to make sure that they, we're not intermingling resources of university resources, so it's nice that it's, um, it's off campus, but it's not <laughs> off campus. The Rev1 space is on Kinnear. So it's, uh, it's really close, but we don't have to count it as being on OSU property. We have lots of partners, as mentioned, to help, um, to help your startup companies succeed. And we do events. I hope you guys come to some of them. We do startup snapshot events. In the spring, we showcase technologies that are looking for business leaders. In the fall, we showcase companies that are looking for capital. We have business leader dinners where we pull all of the folks who are trying to create these startups, we pull them together to share advice and best practices. So we are here to support you. We have a lot more resources that are out there and um, it's one of the reasons why we've been able to grow this ecosystem. But we are always looking to improve. We are always looking to get better. And so we hope that you will continue to interact us and tell us how we can support you. Oh, that's it. 67. We're going so fast, we can't keep up. We're up to 69. So here's our team. Um, thank you very much. I'll be, uh, I, I think I'm just at 1210, so I don't want to delay your lunch, but we'll be around for any questions that you want to ask.